you're able, would you rise to your feet for the reading of God's word for this morning as it comes to us from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. We're going to be in chapter 3, begin chapter 3 today with the time that we have left, but to give us a little context, we're going to back up just a few verses in chapter 2, beginning with verse 19. Hear now the word of the Lord. Paul writes, So then you, you Gentiles, are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. I pray, therefore, that you may not lose heart over my sufferings for you, for they are your glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you know that God has a plan? I'm going to ask that again. How many of you know that God has a plan? Right now, you may be tempted to doubt that plan as you watch the news. Right now, you might be tempted to doubt that plan as you scroll scroll through social media. Right now, you might be tempted to doubt that plan given whatever suffering you might be experiencing in your own life, in your own family, in your own home, in your own body. But today, what we're going to talk about is something that Paul knew, and he knew it in the depths of his being, at the very core of who he was. And that is this, that Paul knew God had a plan, and that's what gave God his, or I'm sorry, gave Paul his purpose. But here's the thing. Paul knew what in a very general sense, God's plan was. What he didn't know for so much of his life was how God was going to bring that plan to fruition. Anybody ever been there? You're like, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I believe you're good. All the things we've been singing all morning, I, I, I believe you're good. You're faithful. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I don't feel like those days are happening right now, but... How many of us have been there or are there right now? We're like, I get the what of God's plan. I just don't see or know the how. If that's where you are, you're in good company. And you're in the right place this morning because that's the kind of thing we're going to talk about. Okay? 
is so important for us to understand as we keep walking through uh, the, the book of Ephesians. We're going to continue, like I said, in chapter 3. We'll see how far we get this morning with the time we have. But understanding that, that what Paul has been doing, he started back in, in, in what we call chapter 1, right, in this letter. It wasn't in chapters as he sent it to the, the early church in the first century. But as we have demarcated it as chapter 1, he talks about this cosmic picture of redemption. Where now what God has revealed, this mystery of the good news of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. How God has brought that to bring together in heaven and on earth all things under the authority of Christ at the right time. That is what God began when Jesus lived and taught and loved and healed and forgave. And then when he died upon the cross that you and I might be reconciled to God. And as we learned in chapter 2 a couple weeks ago, that we might be reconciled to each other. What God began in and through Jesus Christ, he is continuing right now. And the fact that you and I are believers in the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is yet to come, that is proof positive that God's word is going forth and it is still accomplishing that which for he has sent it. Christians everywhere are given over to despair right now and we are seeking to numb ourselves with Netflix. We're seeking to numb ourselves with whatever we think can distract us and take away the pain that is not the time to do this, my friends. Now is the time to take seriously what God has to say about what he has done and what his plan is. And as we read uh, just a couple weeks ago, you remember if you were with us, if you, if you weren't, go back and, and watch that message where the kids, our Christchurch kids helped me two weeks ago. It was amazing. We built a giant cardboard wall of hostility right here on the platform. Because as Paul says in chapter 2, what Christ did in his own body upon the cross was to take the hostility that had endured for generation upon generation upon generation between Jew and Gentile. And he took that hostility, that, that enmity as we call it, which is another word for, for how you feel about your enemy. Think of the person you hate the most right now. Feel that hostility. Now I know we're not supposed to hate as Christians, but come on. There is somebody right now that you are thinking of that just makes everything inside you just clench. And you're like, Lord, forgive me, but I just, I, if you only understood what that person did, if you only understood who that person really is, nobody else knows, but I know. Right now you're thinking that kind of thing. There's somebody in your life that you feel that way about. Lord, have mercy. Paul says, that which endured between Jew and Gentile, that kind of hostility that makes us enemies, that seething disdain and anger and frustration and hatred and disgust, Jesus took that upon his own body upon the cross and put to death the hostility that stood between us as he himself died a sinner's death. Amen. And in that, Paul says in chapter two, he broke down the wall of hostility between us. Lord, have mercy that we would ever understand and ever really experience what that means in the church of Jesus Christ. Because when we start to live in that truth, the world will be in awe. They will say, how is it? How is it that you love one another in this way? I'm not talking about sweeping things under the rug. I'm not talking about denying where there is injustice. Right now, there is a reckoning happening in the church in North America where we are watching pastor after pastor after pastor, leader after leader after leader be called under the carpet for sins that happened 10, 20 years ago. We're watching people be held to account for sins that are systemic, sins that are toxic, sins that that have blasphemed the name of God and, and have turned the most vulnerable, the most oppressed, the most marginalized away from the one who came to gather those lost sheep unto himself, first and foremost. God is not mocked, says Paul in Galatians. People doubt the justice of God all the time. Not so much because of what's happening in the world. The world is the world. People doubt the justice of God because what doesn't happen in the church? It need not be so. And that should give us hope today, not despair. 
because as Jew and Gentile believers are being built together spiritually, as we picked it up in chapter 2, verse 19, into the, the living temple, a dwelling place for the Spirit of God. That is who we are. If you are a believer in Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female, you are brought into this body and you are made one with one another, one body, many members. That's who we are as the body of Christ. So that when one of us hurts, we all hurt. When one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. Whatever your family has been, your family can put the funk in dysfunction. Now you're part of a new family. That's who the church is. There are still places in the world, I'll have you know, it wasn't just 2,000 years ago, where following Jesus meant your family would forsake you. Your family would disown you. And if the church wasn't to be your new family, what hope was there? That's still who we are. That's still how we are. So like I said earlier, Paul had a revelation of God's plan which allowed him to receive and live out his purpose. And yet our problem today is so many of us want to know our purpose, but we don't know God's plan. We don't know enough about God's plan. We want to define our own meaning, our own context of, of who we are and why we are here. And trust me, there are plenty of people in the world that want to tell you who you are and why you're here. Especially if they can sell you something while they do it. Or especially if whatever they have to share with you just so happens to elevate them into a position of power over you. That is not what we see demonstrated in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's not what we see demonstrated in the Apostle Paul. In fact, Paul understood God had a plan. He was so connected to that plan and what it meant for his own purpose that even when he would find himself in prison again and again and again for the sake of the gospel, he could, as he would say, count it all joy. He wrote the book of Philippians, the letter of Philippians, four short chapters while he was in prison, 16 times. He says, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord again, I say, rejoice always. He keeps telling the early church to rejoice, rejoice, rejoice while he is in prison. What did he know that we don't? What did he understand that we don't? Paul knew that some way, somehow, like I said, that there was a what to God's plan. Any good Israelite knew, any good Jew of the first century knew that God had always planned to do something to bring in by his grace the uh, Gentiles. He knew some way, somehow that was going to happen. And let me just show you, Isaiah 49, uh, verse 6, uh, he would have known, known this. Paul would have known this for sure. This is something any good Israelite would have known. Uh, beginning with verse 5, and now the Lord said, who formed me in the womb to be his servant. This is the, the suffering servant servant of Israel who is speaking here, okay? We know that that becomes most fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The one the Lord says who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. In other words, it's not enough that I'm going to bring Israel back to myself through you, God says, to the one who is the suffering servant, the one who is Jesus. He says, that's, that's not enough. He, said, he goes on, verse 6, I will give you as a light to the nations, to the Gentiles, to the, the ethnos, we say it in Greek, which is where we get our, our word ethnic, all the different people groups of the world. I will give you as a light to all of them, to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Surely Paul knew that. Surely Paul knew as he would write himself in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. Let me turn there quickly. He would say to uh, the church in Galatia, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying all the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For Paul, the people of God didn't begin with Moses in the Exodus. It began all the way back with Abraham. And the covenant that was given back in Genesis chapter 12, where God says, walk with me and be made whole in my presence. And through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. That's us. That is us. Stop for a moment and consider the magnitude of what it means to say that all these 
centuries, millennia later, we are the fruit of that. We are children of God now because we are blessed and we are adopted children into the family, into the household of God, as Paul will say. That's who we are. Stop and think about what that means for not just your identity, but your purpose in this life for such a time as this. That's why Paul will say, back to Ephesians chapter 3, this mystery of the gospel that God has now revealed. Again, there was the, the what. Some way, somehow, by his grace, he was going to make a way for the Gentiles to come in. Some way, somehow, it wasn't just about regathering Jacob, regathering Israel. It was now about how do all the peoples, all the nations of the world, how do they know the salvation of God? How is that possible? And now, we didn't know the how, but now Paul does by revelation. You remember? For Paul, he was the one who had been knocked down on the road to Damascus. This afternoon, go back in Acts chapter 9 and read it for yourself. He needed to have the blindness that he had spiritually be removed by God so that he could see the one he was persecuting was actually the one through whom salvation would come to the entire world. Paul's story is, is, is fascinating. We'll hear just a little bit more of it here in a moment. In his own words... But now, the mystery of Christ is revealed, Paul says, by the Spirit, through the, the apostles and the prophets of that first century, his own time. The Gentiles now have become fellow heirs. We're not, we're not just you know, stepchildren that are less than in, in somebody's mind. That's not who we are. We are adopted children who are co-heirs. We are part of the family of God, part of the same body and the promises of Christ Jesus through the gospel. When I was a kid, we used to sing a song, you know, all who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. Again, doesn't matter the color of your skin, doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter what language is your first language, doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, none of that. What God has done to equalize and bring everyone in who would seek to receive him, this is the mystery that is now revealed, Paul says, in his day. And it's still being revealed to hearts and minds all over the world right now. How many of you know that followers of Jesus Christ out in the world making a difference, they don't, they don't make headlines? Rarely are the ones that are, they're, they're not the ones who are sitting there, my phone's on the bench, otherwise I'd pull it out. They're not the ones that are taking a selfie every time they do a good deed either. Posting it to social media, making sure you know how humble they are. <laughs> if we're not paying attention we will take in a diet of, of dismay and despair and darkness as the media feeds it to us of all the terrible things that are happening and all of the suffering in the world and all of the things that are challenging us right now. Like, yeah, I, I know how much it costs to fill my truck right now. I know how much it costs to feed my family right now. I know all of those things. I know how much rent is going insanely through the roof. I know how much our benevolence ministry at Christ Church is getting hammered almost every day by people who have no place to live because they've been edged out of their lease agreements and they can't afford to stay anywhere in the city anymore. This is all as real as it gets. But I also know that the one who has made a way will continue to make a way as those who trust in him, turn to him, say, Lord, show us, guide us, equip us, lead us. He is faithful. He is faithful. And he will do what he has said he will do. So of this gospel, Paul says, Paul understood that very thing. That's why he can sit under house arrest or he can sit in a jail cell and he can speak of joy. He can speak of God's good plan even through him because he knows what the plan is even if right now he doesn't understand how God's making it all come together. There's great mystery in that even, but he knows where this is going. And so can you, so can I, so can we. And Paul, remember, he knew his own story, right? He said, of this gospel, I have become a servant, a minister, diakonos. That's where we get our word deacon. He has become, a, I mean, literally one who serves tables. He has become a servant of all in the life of the church, according to the gift of God's grace, he says. He's going on, verses 7 and 8. Although I'm the very least of all the saints, the least of the least is what that means. This grace was given to me to bring the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ. Paul, as we call him, the, the, the great apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle to the nations, right? But do you know what Paul would say about himself? I'm sure you do. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 
Listen to what Paul says as he's writing to his protege in the ministry. He says, verse 12, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Even though I was formerly a, a blasphemer, a persecutor. You know, you know who he persecuted, right? The church, right? Just real quick, real quick. What's he talking about? I told you to go to Acts 9, but let me jump over there. Just, to, just don't take my word for it. Okay. Acts chapter 9, real quick. Let me get there. I, this, this, is, this is powerful. Remember, he was Saul of Tarsus, and, and, and he goes by his Greek name a little later, which is Paul. It wasn't like he necessarily changed his name. He had, a lot of people had names and, uh, that were similar, but in different languages. So Saul of Tarsus is the same man as we would call Paul the apostle. Chapter 9 of Acts. Meanwhile, Saul, that's him, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest in, the, in Jerusalem and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any who belong to the way, that's, that's the way of Jesus Christ, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Paul was, he was an enforcer, right? He was the one that in his zealousness for Yahweh, he believed that what he had to do was find any of these Christians, stamp them out, stop this blasphemy from spreading any further than it, it had already gone. That's who he was. Breathing threats and murder. Cancel culture, <laughs> Paul wouldn't have had a chance. We would never know who he was. But he knew who he was because he knew who God was now being revealed as in Jesus Christ. He says, I'm grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, back in 1 Timothy 1, who has strengthened me because he has judged me faithful and appointed me to his service even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, one who, who breathed threats and murder, stood by and held the coats while, while they stoned Stephen, one of the first deacons in the early church. And he says this, even verse 13, I was a man of violence. That's who he was. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed from me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So right now, right now, no matter where you've been, even if you're a murderer, there is forgiveness. There is grace abounding and overflowing for anyone who would call upon the name of the Lord. You need to hear that. We need to know that, receive that, and then understand how that is offered to other people. Now, again, there, there are consequences to our actions, of course. I understand that. And, and, and people who are persisting in sin cannot be allowed to continue to do so, especially when that is causing great pain, suffering, and tremendous distress to other people. But the saying is sure, Paul goes on, verse 15 and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, Paul says, of whom I am the foremost. Old King James says, of whom I am chief. Sometimes Paul gets written off as arrogant or, or, or hard-headed sometimes in contemporary biblical interpretation, but I think the man did understand exactly where he came from. And he carried that with him, and he understood that if anybody can be saved. Uh, I was. Surely if God can save me, he can save anyone. If God can bring a man of violence back the way he brought Saul of Tarsus back, what can he do for you? What can he do in you? What can he do through you? Do not give up. When the world says, ah, I can't be changed. When the world says, and quote the prophet Bruce Hornsby, that's just the way it is. Don't you believe it. Don't you believe it. The entirety of the gospel is about transformation. The entirety of the gospel, my God, verse uh, chapter two, but you were dead in your sins and trespasses, Paul said. That's every one of us. But God, in his lavish abundance of grace and mercy, has made us alive together in Christ. 
Every time we baptize, that's what we celebrate. That's what we remember. That's what we honor and recognize and witness. And we remember it in ourselves. So I know time is passing quickly here, and I want to make sure we're not going to get as far as I wanted to today, but that's, that's okay. We need to spend time chewing on the meat of the word in this way because what Paul has to say here is so unbelievably pertinent today, 2,000 years almost after he wrote it. Because we have to understand that, that as this revelation was given to him, as he was knocked down, he was the one who was the persecutor who became the apostle. And so now this gift has been given to him, this understanding of the mystery of Christ, how it had been not made known before, but now the Gentiles are brought in that anyone who would call upon the name of Jesus Christ might be saved. And as he goes on to say, to make everyone see, this is his plan, right? God's plan Paul's purpose, that the plan of the mystery, that through Christ, through his church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So if we had time, I'd take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is where Paul will define the wisdom of, of God. You know how he defines the wisdom of God? The wisdom of God is Jesus himself, embodied. And even further than that, the wisdom of God is Jesus Christ embodied upon the cross. Paul says that the Hebrews, the Jews, the Israelites, they seek wisdom, worldly wisdom. How do I observe what's happening around me and, and, and through experience and then make sure I live my life ordered by that so that I might be successful? That's, that's the traditional definition of what wisdom is. We, we all want to grow in that, and, and Proverbs teaches us that we should. And, and it's important that we should recognize how, how have I made mistakes? How have others made mistakes? How can I live my life now in a way that allows me to be successful, that allows me to live a good life? That's what wisdom in the worldly sense provides, and it's, it's good and right and needed. If you're going to have a good family, if you're going to try to parent your kids well, if you're going to try to manage your resources and be a good steward, you have to have that kind of wisdom. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. Paul is talking about a different kind of wisdom, the wisdom that is embodied in Jesus Christ himself, the kind of wisdom that says, if you want to keep your life, you got to lose your life. If you want to truly live, you got to learn how to die. The kind of wisdom that says, no, 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 the, the, the ones that the, the world lifts up and puts on a pedestal, the ones that we worship and we emulate and we say, ah, those, those are the ones. No, 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 the wisdom of God says, no, the, the first shall be last. And the last shall be first. This week we'll have VBS. I, I, I cannot tell you how passionate I am about VBS, how passionate I am about camps. You know, a lot of pastors just, just kind of cruise through the summer and, and for this month and next month, I'm going 180 miles an hour because I want to be at our camps. I want to be at VBS. I want to do all this because you know what this is? The world will say, ah, kids, they're resilient. Ah, give them an Xbox and throw them in the room and, and someday we'll talk to them when they have something to say. Thank God if you are a part of our VBS this week. And if you can't be with us in person, pray, 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 pray. Encourage somebody who is serving. Encourage somebody who is a part of it. And I know not everybody can because, you know, you've got jobs and other obligations. I get that. That's okay. But for such a time as this, how do we combat the darkness? How do we live our purpose out according to God's good and right plan? Wherever we are, however we have a chance to speak life, however we have a chance to counter the messages of darkness and despair and nihilism and meaninglessness that continue to bombard, especially our children. VBS is an unbelievably simple way to do that. Tomorrow morning, I'll be out there in the lobby, and as will others here, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fist bump every kid. I'm going to make sure I look them in the eye, make sure they know I see them, make sure I know I love them, not because they need to know Ben Anderson loves them and sees them. They need to know God loves them and sees them. They need to understand that they are known, they are seen, they are valued. Because as the world increasingly only values you for what you can do, and then when they think you're spent, they will chew you up, spit you out, and leave you by the side of the road. That's not who we are, church. We are the opposite of that. Your value is not in what you do. Your value is not in what you can provide. Your value is in who you are. 
And God is the one who has defined who you are. God is the one who has said, I will make the way. I will open up the doorway for any who would call upon my name, who would come and accept the invitation. When Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That means all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. That's plenty of us today, isn't it? He says, take my yoke upon you. Take my teaching upon you and learn from me. Not social media, not Fox News, not MSNBC, not your grandmother who's a conspiracy theorist par excellence. Don't. (laughs) Sorry, I had to do that. (laughs) Learn from me. Do you know who Jesus is speaking as when he says that? The embodiment of wisdom. Learn from me, for I am gentle, I am humble in heart. My yoke, Jesus says, my teaching, that's what that means, is easy. The better translation is, it is well-fitting. It is made for you. You are made for it. Quit fighting. Quit resisting. Quit running. Stop and let the one who loves you, who knows you, lift you up in his arms. What I want to do right now is I want to show you a video. The week before last, we took a team out to Black Mountain Home for Children, Youth, and Families. And, and again, here's one more example. When, when, when you're saying, what, what is my purpose? Wherever God has you, there is a way that you can be a source of, of, of light and hope and encouragement and life in a world that is so fixated, in our culture at least, on death. And what I want to show you is, this is a video that that our communications director, Shelby Anderson, did an awesome job helping us put together to just show you a little bit about what this trip was about, what it meant. Thanks to Pastor Scott Kreider and, and his team for leading us and championing that. Huge thanks to Dave and Tracy Chumley, who are, are builders and planners extraordinaire, and they were the ones who, who helped coordinate the projects and, 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 and get all the resources together that we needed. I mean, it's amazing. This church contributed well over $35,000 that went into resources that we immediately put into this, this facility to bless children who, I mean, when Jesus says the widows, the orphans, the aliens, the, these, these, are, these are literal orphans. Who loves them. The church loves them, but more importantly, God loves them. And the chance we have to make a difference, the chance we have to say, no, the way of death and darkness is not the way. There is one who is the way, the truth, the life. He sees you. He knows you. He has a plan for your life. So let's roll that video and see more about what we experienced. I'm Ben, and I'm part of our missions team here uh, from Christ Church at the Black Mountain Children's Home this week. And it's been our blessing, our privilege, and I really mean that, to be able to serve this uh, community. It's such a blessing to be able to be here to help take a space that had fallen in disrepair and, and was not being used for anything other than, than storage. Turn it into what's gonna be a worship center, what's gonna be a place for people to gather for all kinds of family gatherings and what this is gonna mean in the life of these kids and all those who would gather in this space. So a lot of our kids come to us and they're not true orphans anymore. They're, they're really orphaned by circumstance or by the family court system in North Carolina. And what that looks like is they've been abused, neglected, or abandoned. Um, and they come to us from you know, tons of different circumstances. Over time, federal and state funding for children's home is reducing. And it's possible that because it's a Christian ministry, and because of the other changes that they may not have funds from government to to provide for the kids that need care. And so by by renovating and, and creating a place that's income generating, it helps this ministry, this organization to survive long term to take care of kids despite re- reduction of funds from the government. It's it's one thing when you get a bunch of like you know construction people who know what they're doing and you know you can go in there and tear it all up but It's a beautiful thing when you get to teach people.
And so one of my favorite things is to see how how we get, get kids from sixth grade and, and even younger all the way up until uh, college age that are here, that are learning, that are growing. And then you teach one of these kids how to run a saw, run a drill, do something, and they turn around and teach somebody else. And it's just amazing to see how that builds confidence, how that builds self-esteem, how it makes them say, you know what, we can not only learn these, these, these skills, but we can use them to serve and love each other and serve and love others. This mission trip is intentionally an intergenerational effort that's not just youth. This year with 54 people, 20 or so of the people here are students, a couple are kids that are younger than middle school age, and then the rest are uh, adults. So this is very much a church-wide effort to not just accomplish the task of putting in windows, but to teach those who may not know how to put in windows the skills. They gave us the opportunity to, to play ball and, and have a cookout with the, some of their kids, something we had never expected and never sought after. We enjoy being in the back band, had no problem with that. And yeah. so that was an honor for us. They want these kids to hear the Word of God and to hear the name of Jesus Christ. And that is part of the reason that we will always support this place is because they're willing to give up their funding from the government. And we want to make sure that that doesn't stop them from doing what they do so well, because that is the most important thing. So we, we often hear Romans 12 to discussed and quoted about responding to God and this is your spiritual act of worship and we're laying our life down. And a lot of times we limit those, that we limit Romans 12, 1 to worship on a Sunday morning, but we've, we've, got, we've got to realize that our response to who God is and our responsibility to others is a lifestyle of worship, is a lifestyle of laying our life down. And so this work is a spiritual act of worship, responding to God's goodness in a way that serves others. Um, every time a child pulls on this property, if the grass is cut and the bushes are trimmed and there's no weeds in the flower beds and there's fresh mulch in the flower beds, um, you can say a whole lot to youth without saying a thing. And, and being when they see that, when they pull into campus and they see that, you know, it reminds me of a passage in Luke where God says, and, and this is the Bible according to Jimmy, so, so this is in chapter and verse, but if God loves the grass and the flowers of the field and he, the birds of the air, and he clothes the flowers in these, in these beautiful colors, and, and he cares so much about them, then surely he cares about us. And that's the same premise. If a youth comes on campus for the first time and they see everything clean and everything in order, then they know if they care for the bushes and they care for the landscape, then surely they're gonna care for me. And that allows us to say a whole lot to them without saying anything. You know, it's a picture of redemption. It's a picture of what God does, where he meets us where we are in our brokenness, meets us where we are thinking that, that, that we've been forgotten, thinking that we've been left behind, and yet we are able to be uh, uh, picked up in the arms of our Father and changed. Thank you again to, to everybody who made that trip possible and, and has now for a number of years. And, and what, what I love most about that experience is, as, as you saw, I mean, our, our, we have elementary age kids there that are part of our team. We have, we have senior citizens who are part of our team. And, and it's amazing how we all come together in, in fellowship, in worship. We all come together in working and what's happening. I mean, I mean we, don't, we don't go there with the idea that we're going to, you know, do the greatest construction project we can in the shortest amount of time because we got, we got people there that are learning, right? We got people there that are, have never, never picked up a, an impact drill. They've never picked up a hammer. And, and we're trying to figure out how do we teach? How do we help? How do we walk alongside each other and grow? And it, it's, it's so powerful. 
and, and here's the thing, whatever stage of life you are in, wherever you are, however much experience you have or don't have, however long you've been following Jesus, or, or if you're, you're not even sure what that means, or, or if you're just exploring what, what Christianity might be for you, here's the thing, God has a plan. He has a plan for all of us. He has a plan for you individually. And again, you, you, you can't age out of it. You can't you know, have not enough skills or the wrong skills. What God's gonna do is if you just say, Lord, here I am, here I am. I'm gonna take by faith that you are who you say you are and that you're going to do what you've said you're going to do. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. We used to sing that, right? So today, I want to invite you to do that. And just, just see. If you do that, I bet before the day is over. I'm serious. Before Monday morning comes, God will have an opportunity for you to be somebody who, who moves in a way that brings life and positivity into this world. I'm not talking about just having the right positive mental attitude. I'm talking about in the way of Jesus Christ. Or that kind of love, that kind of giving, that kind of sacrifice, because Paul understood that. That's why that man could sit in prison and encourage other people who were free. It's because he understood that his life had purpose and meaning and value because it was part of God's greater plan. And what Paul would say to the church in Philippi is that what God has begun, he will finish. What God has begun, he will bring to its fullness. And that applies in your life, that applies in my life, that applies in all of our lives. And so I want you to understand that. So what is your purpose? According to his plan. So if you're able, would you stand to your feet with me? Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, we are thankful. So thankful for the privilege it is to gather together, to come together as, as many members of one body. And we come from every ethnos, every people group you can imagine. Even here in Christ Church, as we heard on Pentecost, over, over 10 languages spoken, we could have shared at least that many more. Lord, speaking your word. We come from different generations, different social economic groups. We come from different levels of experience and education, people who've lived in the country their whole lives, people who've never left the city, people who come from every single background you can think of. And yet you and your mistakes and gracious goodness and love. You are the one that says, I will weave you together to make one people with Christ Jesus as the center, the cornerstone, the keystone, the one who holds it all together as you build us up, oh God, to be your dwelling place for you, Holy Spirit. Lord, show us right now today. I, I pray for each and every one of my brothers and sisters hearing my voice right now in this room, online, even someone watching this later in the week. Lord, I pray, I pray right now that you would move in our hearts, that you would still fear, that you would still anxiety, feelings of, of despair. Lord, I know there is so much that we can look at in this world right now that causes us to doubt your faithfulness, your goodness, your plan to gather all things together in him, in heaven and on earth, oh God. But Lord, no matter what we face, we can endure any how if we know why we are here, if we know we are yours if we know we belong to you. So no matter what we may be facing right now, Lord, we need people uh, to be equipped. Father, we have people in this congregation who are grieving the death of loved ones. We have people in this congregation who are searching desperately for work, oh God. We have people who are searching for a place to live. We have people who are in need of healing in their bodies. People who are in need of healing in their relationships, oh God. We have people that are in need of healing within their own minds, Father, who are dealing with mental illness and capacities or or. or or, or the disease of addiction, Lord, which has taken them in ways that they never imagined they would, they would 
be taken. And so, Father, we lift up all of our brothers and sisters as one body to you right now, asking you to move, to be faithful to who you are in ways, Lord God, that show us that we are yours. Lord, let us look for ways to love and serve each other, to be your church. Lord God, to be salt and light in this world for such a time as this. Let it begin with us right here, right now as your church. Let the world see and let the world know as we testify through our love for each other. That's what you said. This is how they will know you're my disciples. If you love one another as I have loved you. So Lord, let us walk in that today and let it overflow by your spirit through your people into this community right here in Nashville and beyond, Lord God. We don't have to go all the way to Black Mountain Home to share what it is you've put within us, Lord God, to bring life and light and hope, to be a people on mission, to bring hope and wholeness through Christ, Lord. That is who we are because of what you have done and because of who you are. So Father, right now, today, I pray that you would speak to everyone who hears my voice. Let us know our purpose, individually and collectively. Let us know who we are as part of your plan, a plan of salvation, a plan for hope, a plan for truth and life. Thank you, God. We know what you have begun, you will bring to completion. And we thank you, we trust you, we praise you for it. In the name of the one in whom it all comes together, in the name of the one by whom you have made this all possible, in the name of the one through whom we know you, we are known by you. And we may love you because you have first so radically, graciously, sacrificially, and fully loved us. We praise you now in Jesus' holy, holy, holy name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And may you leave this place to share it with those to whom he may send you now. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, receive this blessing as God's people in the world for such a time as this. Amen and amen. Let us go to serve and love one another.